Very good. Welcome to our, our next in our share showcase series, teaching online science labs, this one for astronomy. In the process of this presentation, an hour long, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions for the first 45 minutes or so. Please do that by typing your questions in the chat and I will monitor. Um, if you have, it, it, feel free to put comments in there too. And if you have a question, please precede the question with a question mark and then <clears throat> my eyes will go right to it. I can ask Joanne at appropriate times. And then as she's closing up in about 45 minutes, we'll open it up so you can unmute yourselves and ask your question audibly if you wish. Let me introduce our present presenter. Joanne Iceberg has taught astronomy at Chafee College since 2003, online and face-to-face. -face. She earned a PhD in the history of astronomy from Harvard University and she loves to use historical stories to engage general education students in the sciences. She is particularly interested in active learning pedagogy and seeks to translate its values to online instruction. Joanne, take it away. Okay, well, hello everybody. A few of us had a little chance to chat before we got started here. Um, so uh, I think, uh, first hi, but mostly I think you don't need to, so much to see my face, so I am going to share my screen. So let me hit screen share here and click into my PowerPoint here. And let's share that. There we go. Okay, if I can have a thumbs up from somebody that they're actually seeing. Okay, a slideshow. That's a good thing. Let's play it from the start here. And I'll start talking. Okay, well, hi, everybody. And um, all that is true. I have been teaching for a while online as well as face to face. Um, I have been teaching hybrid for longer than I have been teaching completely online, but I have been teaching a completely online astronomy lecture and lab course for for I guess it's about a year now. So my contact with this precedes um, the, the COVID pandemic. Um, I feel a little diffident about giving this presentation to you because I feel like I am my 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 contact with online labs is very much a work in progress. In fact, it's a little ironic that I got into this particular event by communicating with Bob somewhat earlier about uh, actually seeking more information about access to online astronomy labs and figuring there were people out there who must surely know much, much, much more than I did and please put me in contact with them. And it turned out that while I'm still morally convinced that there are such people, they haven't yet made themselves available, outspoken and whatnot. And so I wasn't getting access to nearly as much of that. So we thought we'd have this presentation. So we, I will survey for you sort of what I think there is, what I have in fact actually done in the last year, um, leap to the punchline. Yeah, it's okay. It works okay. It's, you, you can dive into that, but also to think about what we might do as a group to improve the situation here. Um, first thing I want to say is that much of what I'm presenting is not entirely of my own making, although you'll see my versions of a great deal of it, um, but it draws on the work of many people, and I, I'll try to remember to mention those people as we go through. Okay, so let's get started. Um, online, online science labs in... You, at least for me, you've frozen, Joanne. Okay, I just unmuted you. Okay, all right, I'm back again. Thumbs up? Thumbs up. Do I need to reshare my screen? I think I probably do. Yes. Okay. Can I have a thumbs up from somebody that we're back in business? Back in business. Back in business. Okay, all right. So why, why are we even doing this? Obviously, one reason we're offering labs online right now is simply to deal with the pandemic situation we find ourselves in. But I would like to sort of emphasize that that's not really the whole or even the greatest reason. In the long run, not the short run, but the long run, we offer labs online to serve the diverse needs of our students. Uh, we want to give something that isn't just thrown together, but it 
its educational quality. It makes our curriculums of record. It, it, it captures our SLOs. It integrates with our lecture courses. We want to do it in a way that provide that promote student engagement, which is to say, I think that it, it provides challenge without, without awakening student fear. It's not trivial stuff, nor is it totally overwhelming. Very importantly, we're moved by equity because some of our students find this the way they can meet a general education science. That's the way their lives are. And in doing so, we need to be sure that what we're offering is no cost, low cost, demands minimal supplies or technological stuff beyond the computer, tablet, or phone they have to have to be participating in this anyway. But we can't make very many assumptions about what they might have as technology, what they may have as background resources. So we need to provide a lot of variety and flexibility to meet their situations. And the other thing we need to, and so I'll lump those all as equity, which is subtly different from the concept of accessibility, uh, which I think generally is taken to mean ability and disability. Um, we also need to pay great attention to whether our labs really are accessible. And that's kind of like the elephant in the room. Um, I'd say we're not there yet, really. We can talk a little bit more about le that later. I just want you to know that's one of the things I think is really important to be paying attention to here. So, so why astronomy? Why are we even here thinking about this? Um, astronomy has a lot of advantages as an online subject. I mean, we have a history of online astronomy education that actually goes back decades, and some of it's very good. Uh, astronomy ought to be easy to make as a remote a remote instruction in astronomy, you would think, would be easy because astronomy is a remote science. Uh, we, we, we do the astronomy of things we'll never bring into a laboratory. Um, another, another advantage we have is that we're, we're addressing a gen ed uh, clientele, and this presentation really is named gen ed classes. Some of what I say really would not be true if you were trying to address um, majors a little further along in a sequence with their particular special pre-professional needs. But we're gen ed, let's go with it. Um, that's ironic, because when you actually look at the resource lists that exist for online astronomy labs, they're pretty short. They're much shorter than comparable lists I've looked at in biology and chemistry. I think there are reasons for that. One is that um, there are many reasons. Among them are that astronomy really has kind of resisted, especially gen ed astronomy, having a kind of a canon, you know, the specific topics that you're supposed to study in astronomy or that you're supposed to teach in astronomy. We don't work together as much as we could on this. And as that may be part of why we don't have an accepted lab curriculum that would make it easy for someone to sail in and, um, and actually start building labs in the confidence they would meet everybody's needs. Uh, one, and a reason for that is that instructors have many different legitimate goals for their labs. Some people want their students to experience the natural world of naked eye or small telescope astronomy, to delve into the physics of astronomy, to use the technology of astronomy. Some people are much more moved by things that are kind of methodological, um, that students learn how to construct uh, scientific investigations. And um, that's somewhat different. Uh, I, later, I'll mention the sort of flagship technique there, backwards faded scaffolding, um, which is a very, well, we'll get to that later. The other thing, and this is perhaps my most important interest, I'm very interested that students experience real world things. But as a sort of learning outcome, I am terribly moved by the idea that students need to be able to relate their lab activities to the ideas that they learn in lecture class. And this comes, I think, from my own undergraduate and maybe early graduate school experience, where I really felt that, that everyone seemed to think I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, and I had a very limited ability to relate the lab material to the lecture material. And I've since thought that's just, that, that's not what it's about. Um, and so that's one of my main goals. Okay, so what do we have out there? Follows uh, a few slides of kind of my survey of what I found when I've looked out there. So a couple of interactive simulations that I really, really like um, are projects like the Nebraska Astronomy Applet Project and FET. Uh, I don't really know what, quite what FET stands for, but it's run out of the University of Colorado. And these have, uh, they, these have in common the idea that they are really well crafted very um, 
what's the right way to say this? They're, they're, they, they, they think like astronomy teachers and physics teachers think. Uh, they have large, ra big ranges of physics, astrophysics, and in the case of, of NAP, it's all astronomy all the time, uh, topics that are well thought out. They have simulations that let you, very flexible simulations that let you play with a lot of stuff. Um, they have a problem, and their problem is flash. Their problem is that Flash is ceasing to be available even on computers and almost all of these applets started as Flash applications and so they have projects to rewrite them in something more useful like HTML5 and these projects are ongoing but they're not there yet. In, in both cases they only have a small fraction of their, 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 their library of simulations available in a way your students can get at it. Although I was noticing one or the other of these. I guess it's FET says there are ways in which you can download it and then use it but I don't know if that works for students with, with as minimal technology some of ours have. Um, I guess we should say NAP comes with kind of the, the simulations incorporated into complete labs. It's easy to use for an instructor if you could use it. FET doesn't come incorporated, but there are all kinds of simulations that teachers have contributed and uploaded. They're both free. That really matters to me uh, for, for, from an equity point of view. Okay, another sort of simulation not to dwell too long on those. Another sort of simulation, which if you're in a community college, which I think you all are, is now uh, literally integrated into Canvas and you can access it, is Labster, which is quite a different approach to a simulation. Um, if you, maybe I should click back once and just point out the sort of representative screens at the bottom there. They're simple streamlined. They're enough that a student probably understands that maybe they have orbits of a planet of the moon and earth around the sun on the right hand side on the left it's i think most astronomers would realize that that's lunar phases i think the students pick that up oh boy labster labster immerses a student in a much more realistic looking online environment it even has avatars um yeah there do you see isaac newton in one of these screens you guys are your pictures are yeah okay i'm looking over at the upper right hand screen isaac newton comes to teach you about gravity what could be what could be better than that the problem from an astron oh and the good thing about it from an astronomy instructor's perspective is literally you load this lab into your canvas course in several clicks, uh, you could learn how to do it in five minutes and you have a pile of labs sitting there already with assignment grade, assignment grade lines. Problem, problem is that there's very little for astronomy. There are a small number of physics labs. There are about four of those that are plausibly astronomical. About two of them tackle the way an astronomy teacher would do it. So yeah, use both of them, but that still leaves you a lot of the rest of the term. So what else do we have here? Um, I'd like to draw your attention. So those were all sims of various sorts. Um, the next thing I'd like to briefly address is the idea of a complete written online lab curriculum. And I wish in this case GEAS had sort of been out there in lights. I, again, can't quite remember what it stands for, but it was put together by, principally by Nicole Vogt, and she's at uh, New Mexico State, that uh, looks like I wrote MN. It should be NM for New Mexico uh, in a, a NASA and NSF funded collaboration. It is a complete lab curriculum. It's enormous. It is a survey of astronomy. It has real data. It uses simulations. It has videos, instructive videos. The only problem is it, it might be a little too much. It might be more than you want in such a course. It's um, it's very interested in teaching scientific method and numeracy. Very great attention to equity measures, for instance, there's no printer needed, but here's a quirk of it. As Nicole will say, she wrote it for a specific clientele, rural students who find it difficult to get to a college campus. And therefore, my urban students looked at some of these things and they just, we're flabbergasted. Why are there examples about dairy herds? I know nothing about cattle. Uh, one of these labs asks me to go out and find soil of different textures, sandy, gravelly, hot, large, large grade and small grade gravel. I can't do that. Well, you know, if I did that, I'd go to I'd go to a garden store and spend quite a lot of money on pricey soils. So, so it's not necessarily 
maybe this brings up something I'm going to have to say in general. Lab curricula can be really good for what they are, and they may not exactly work for you. There's always going to be some need to tailor, tailor things to what you're trying to produce. However, this is spectacular. Again, it's free. Another totally different option would be to go to some of the large data sets available, of which I'll just call out Zooniverse, although there are others. You can read about what Zooniverse is. It's a huge platform of um, real research projects, citizen science research projects that um, are done by volunteers. They, they're, the projects court volunteers by providing these large data sets and encouraging people to do their own science. And you can do real science. Many things, uh, many topics in biology, um, history, meteorology, and lots in astronomy. I think it actually started with a galaxy project. So there's lots of projects downside to Zooniverse. They're not, not all crafted as a lab. You would probably have to write your lab so your students could use this data, but very, very promising nonetheless. There are also manuals, and many of the lab manuals out there actually have minor equipment needs. They provide images and data sets and printable formats for paper tools. There are lecture tutorials that are kind of sort of like halfway to labs, which you might be able to repurpose. Ah, oh, I was going to mention backward failed to the scaffolding. Possibly the most striking of all of this, I will just sort of point at that dark blue middle page. No, no, it's the one on the right. The, sort of research in astronomy produced by Slater, Slater, Palma, and Krugnow uses an extremely well-crafted approach called back, a detailed approach to, to teaching what science investigation does by sort of scaffolding some investigations for students and then gen pushing them to make their own investigations while the scaffolding is slowly pulled away and they must craft every part of a scientific investigation. Hence, it's called backward phased scaffolding, BFS. And it's the, I associate it with CAPER, the Center for Ast Astronomy and Physics Education Research. Um, I like some things about it, something, and, and you could probably use these directly as labs, although I think students often feel it's a little overly directive. Um, so take a look at that, and there are, you don't have to have much to do that, although here's the problem with all of these manuals. They're rarely free, and at Chafee, we really made a commitment, oh, several years ago, to offer fully free courses. So we're actually not using any of those either. So what are we doing? Um, and I guess this is the point at which uh, I feel a little diffident. This is a lot of this is a work in progress, so please be kind about it. But at Chafee and at our neighboring Citrus College, I, for anyone who wasn't privy to the, the little chat at the beginning, my husband, Dave Carey, who I think is listening in here, is an astronomy instructor at Citrus College, and we teach kind of comparable courses, and we've always lo long been our, uh, our co-conspirators here. So in some cases, I don't know where, where my sentence starts and his sentence ends, but we sort of finish each other's sentences. So some of this is developed jointly. So we've developed a suite of labs in use at both of these places that cover a wide range of topics to get you from naked eye astronomy through planets, stars, galaxies, depending on whether your course surveys all of that or whether your course focuses in a little more narrowly on it, like planets class in the stars, galaxies, cosmology course. There's tremendous variety, which is for the sake of equity. Uh, approachable online tools and simulations and stuff you can do with household supplies and real world experiences. Here's some of what we think you need in labs like this. You need to teach them to do something and then offer some kind of exploration question or a best, a summary, something that forces them to critically think about that very thing I said at the beginning that I took me a while to get in my education. Um, going from going from what the lab is to how this relates to the lecture material. Not very mathy, mostly formatted in ways you can easily, easily embed in Canvas, but works in progress, especially as regards accessibility. And, and we are eager to share these with you. So what topics do we cover? Well, here's the list of them. I don't know that I should really read them to you, because you can read. 
Um, but they do run from sky stuff and moon observing through, uh, through some of the basic physics of astronomy. Um, we have, and I haven't really included a bunch more planetary stuff, cool stuff with astronomical imaging, although only a little bit of it, and some more galaxy oriented topics. And so this is what we actually use this, this, this busy semester here and what we've used a little bit in the past. So I think before I turn to my course and show you what my course looks like inside, uh, I want to quickly run down some of the lessons we think we got out of spring 2020, um, which is a little anomalous because of course, these were not people who signed up for most of them for an online educational experience. These were people who did not necessarily have the technology to do that very well. And these were people often in, sometimes in fairly dire life circumstances, and yet we were hoping to get them to go on with college. So we discovered, we felt we needed to offer a very wide range of choice to be flexible in format and timing, not to worry too much about synchronizing lecture and lab, and above all, to give students choices of all kinds of things whether they worked in a group or individually. Um, so, and, and well, we'll talk more about that when we look at individual labs, but I just wanna draw your attention to the cascade of pictures on the right, which was our little image, result from a student. This is actually one of Dave's students at Citrus of our imaging lab in which they have a, um, a raw picture, a, a, a red, unprocessed red image of the Orion star forming region, which is then a processed red image, it looks white, right, but it's really in a red filter, and then finally constructed as what I think is an absolutely gorgeous um, three color image in which you can see all kinds of detail. Yeah, the trapezium's a little burned out, but a student put that together. By, by, Byron Solar, I can't say this, Solarzano at Citrus College put that together from the instructions, and I think that's a pretty good thing for a, for a gen ed student to assemble. So let's see, I think at this point, I'm going to stop my screen sharing for a second and um, ask, is this a good moment to ask a few questions about that stuff or should I really dive right into showing my course to people? And I guess I'm addressing that question to Bob since he's the one minding the chat. Yeah. Things we uh, should say right now? There's a couple of questions you can address maybe. Okay. Or one is, are the NAP labs really being revamped to HTML5 or other formats? Uh, for the last year, this person writes, I have not been seeing them updated and it, it's very sad. They are the very best astro simulation around, I think. Updates seem to be made by individual faculty. So I stumble on them from time to time, but if anyone knows of a one-stop resource, please share. Okay, I, I, that's more than I know about it. Yeah, I've yeah. looked in at the HTML5 and thought, wish this was more things. I did notice, was it NAP or was it, I can't remember whether it was NAP or whether it was FET, they'd love you to contribute some money to the project, which kind of tells you what funding they don't have for the project. Right. So, yeah. Right. Don't know, you know more than I do. <laughs> okay. Um, another question uh, that came from Andrew Park um, is about transferability. Um, one question he had, uh, are there articulation transfer issues with labs using only simulations or pre-recorded data? Even though for UC CSUGE transfer, the lab component isn't needed at my school, our introductory astronomy course is offered as lecture only. I have seen students who did need the lab component for transfer reasons outside of UC CSU and at least looking at articulation documents for physics, transfer institutions had preference for at least a majority of the real world data in labs. And some even say, if you're looking at CIP descriptors, hands-on, you know, 80% hands-on or something like that. Um, I, I, Joanne, do you know, I could, I could address some of this. Unless well, I'll, I'll address a tiny bit of it and then you address the rest of it. I mean, I share the concern that a lab that does not address the real world isn't really a lab. Of course, astronomy never gets hands-on with any planet besides Earth for reasons that immediately we, we know. However, there is, you can have substantial observing components 
Um, how much you want to do with uh, image processing really depends on your estimation of what um, technology the students might have available. I know that Sina might want to contribute later to this discussion, but I will point out that there is a certain amount of naked eye stuff that you can do even for a gen ed student. I would list moon observing is always among my students' favorite labs, and that's totally naked eye. You can do a certain amount with um, gnomon observing. You can send them to look at uh, the physics of astronomy, spectroscopy. Um, a little more challenging to do infrared because, um, because that's something you would be asking them to view someone else's pictures typically. So you can certainly argue that what you have is not entirely simulation. Whether it meets a threshold, that this is a point at which I'm going to turn it over to Bob to see if he knows, if, if, if his set of answers might answer that bit. Is it supposed to meet a threshold of more than 20, 50, 80 percent? I don't know. Yeah. Um... And we have some guidelines on this, but nothing definitive, at least not in certain areas. Um, for instance, if you go to the CID descriptors um, for statewide uh, transfer model curriculum, you won't see much astronomy, many astronomy descriptors there, and none for a lab. Mm -hmm. um, the general GE guidelines for, um, for transfer to CSU and UC describe science labs and what is required. And it is also very general. Uh, there's a lot of gray and elbow room in there. Mm -hmm. They require a lab manual, a separate lab manual, if there's a lab component or a lab course. But they don't prescribe if uh, it needs to be hands-on or in a wet lab or uh, using simulations. Um, they leave that up to the local curriculum committees, apparently. But some of the CID descriptors for instance, Andrew showed me one for phys a physics class, class, and uh, I also saw one for um, anatomy with lab. Mm -hmm. uh, do say hands-on, and the anatomy with lab said 80% hands-on, which in theory could be either on campus or perhaps a kit that students mm -hmm. can get to have 80% of their activities. But there is no such, such prescription for astronomy, and there's not many CID descriptors for science labs at all in their inventory just yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, so you won't have a lot of TMCs that are about astronomy because you don't have very many astronomy majors. Right. So we're really talking, at least I'm talking mostly about a, um, a gen ed situation. And I guess at this point, my feeling would be if it's not very specific, we need to work with running to make good ones. And if we go out and make good ones, then I think what we make will be much more acceptable than if we decide not to play because it's all too vague. Uh, that's just a sort of political point of view on my right, right, and we certainly need to keep our eye on this, but uh, given the fact that the CSU uh, chancellor has accepted for transfer classes in any modality. Um, right now we're okay. Right now we're okay, except for those where a CID descriptor might specifically say, 80% hands-on, we should be okay for transferability for uh, online simulations. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed Shatilla, Jan, Shatilla Vanderveen's uh, name come up, and I know she's worked at UCs, so I don't know if she has a point of view about that or if it was a question about something completely different, but may, or maybe later in the, in, the, in the commentary. Very good. Uh, oh, hi, waves. <laughs> And, and Andrew, I think also suggested, uh, we're, we're also talking about transfer to private institutions and, and those institutions who are not UC and CSU. And of course, students need to talk with their counselor about uh, any yeah. such transfer issues with them. Um, to sound a little jaundiced about this, I mean, there is so little monitoring of what it actually means to have a face-to-face -face astronomy lab that I think they're fooling themselves if they're absolutely convinced that face-to-face -face necessarily means real-world data. It doesn't necessarily, which may or may be a dirty secret, but you look around that there's so little uniformity in what we do, um, which is both the pro and con of what we do. Uh, during our talk, we've gotten lots of new messages here. Let me read a couple and then we might postpone for the end of the presentation. How do you maintain relationship between lecture and lab, but also have less synchronizing between lecture and lab? 
question. Oh, that's a complicated one. Um, I think that my long-term goal is, well, let me show you that when I get to the course. I think okay. that would be okay. a really good one to answer. If, if I don't answer that in course, remind me that that's what I'm supposed to do because I kind of clump things. Um, all right, yeah. I'll save that for later. In fact, let me save all of them for later and have you go through your course tour and then we'll come back. And at that point, we'll allow you to unmute and ask your questions audibly if you prefer. Okay. All right. Well, let me, let me go for a screen share and share a different part of my screen here. Okay. There we go. Okay. Here's my course. Well, it isn't really my course. As you see at the top, it's a sandbox. And so it's a sandbox that brings together a range of things. I'm just going to clear up my screen a little. Can I get a thumbs up on people that you're seeing what looks like a canvas course? Okay, good. All right. Um, it is actually a sandbox, so don't be perturbed about the timing seeming to come kind of wildly and occasionally the numbering system screws up because I've been merging some different things, partly in order to get um, the best of several approaches, partly in order to get in some things that were uh, planetary as well as some things that were stars, galaxies, and cosmology. And I'll answer that question. I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown. Bob said it might be helpful if I gave you like the 60 seconder on the way this is arranged and then we'll go in. So this, this course, the navigation about this course is basically you read the announcement, you start at the top and you just keep hitting the next button as you go down, 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 down past a lot of introductory how do you do stuff into a sort of typical, um, let's scroll past the first lab because it's not exactly typical, into a sort of typical module which will have some sort of set of online lectures followed by a quiz that addresses the lectures, followed by a requirement that the students upload their notes. I'm not checking their notes in the detail, I'm just checking off that they're taking notes, right? But they are a little crafted guided note taking questions. There may be discussions there. The, the, the chief critical thinking part about the, um, the lecture part of the course is really the discussions. And, and this one, can we measure everything with numbers, goes nicely with the, the math that was the, the, the topic there. Uh, although the discussions are often, um, point of view discussions. They're not uh, be sure you understand things discussions. They're point of view discussions, most of them. Then everything labeled MSSQ is a mystery solar system question. And the students are issued each their own solar system, which um, in the case of solar systems is a fantasy simulation solar a data sheet intended to represent what we might know if we knew more about an exosystem. And everything they do about that in a calculation or a description or a little essay about how a planet might form is done with a planet that comes off their data sheet. So you can't go Google planet, inner planet four, because everybody in class is a different inner planet four. And you really have to know what it means to have, be at a certain distance, be of a certain mass, density, um, surface temperature, etc. So they really are pushed on to being able to think about what planets really are like. Oh, and I guess I should say, this is a planets course, the, really, um, because it is with the planets course that Chafee bundles its lab. So, but some of my labs come from Citrus, and there the labs are bundled with stars, galaxies, and cosmology. Um, so that's kind of the, the version of the course. We get another module, Sky, here. Let's take a look at the way a lab is presented. Um, moon observing project. So you actually have the lab, and I could click on that in a moment. I will point out that in some labs, I've decided to include a discussion where they help each other. This is, this is naked eye observing. One way they simply help each other is by pointing out that they can see the moon right now. You could go see it. And then um, here is a quirk. Is it a quirk or a feature? I don't know if it's a bug or a feature. I'm still deciding. I have presented, if you're familiar with Canvas, you see that my lab is presented as a page, not an assignment. And then there is a lab upload assignment. That is ridiculous in lab two here because it, there is really just one lab. But this goes ahead to answer how I might work with lab lecture continuity while I'm also doing flexibility. So let me scroll down to labs number four through seven. By now we have gotten past many topics right through matter and light. Astronomers may well 
realize that that means naked eye astronomy. We've probably talked about, we have, we've talked about some of the physics of astronomy, um, gravity, orbits, matter, motion, energy, um, light. And then, so we're weeks and weeks into the term, and there have been several required labs to get you to this point. But now I present them with four different labs, a plus, uh, I, I'm calling it a lab cluster. I invented that terminology this morning. Uh, so it's a cluster of labs. You're supposed to, you get as seven choices, I think, if you count it up. And these are simply presented as pages to which you could click. And then you have four different points at which you could upload them. They probably should be dated to sort of force you to do a lab a week. But for the sake of flexibility, you don't have to do any particular lab in a week. You can only do, pick your favorite four out of the seven presented. So if it turns out you can't do them, then can't do one of them for one reason or another, you don't have to. Let me just click let me not click on two of them. I'm going to not click on universal gravitation and I'm going to not click on conservation of energy because they are plain old Labster labs, which it's not that I don't think they're good. It's just that you can go look at Labster for yourself. So go look at Labster for yourself. You could do those. Uh, let's take a quick look at spectroscopy because it's a favorite of mine. So I'm going to double click spectroscopy here. Um, this is the way I'm presenting a lab. There's a, and maybe it should come in a different order, but there's a little bit of background. It tells you what you have to turn in to upload it. And it also literally gives you the link to the instructions, which is, because I wrote it this way, yet another page. So let's click on the page. And it, uh, for some reason, I don't understand my, Computers decided everything is dangerous, but I think this will load in just a second. Slowly, it will load in just a second. Give it a minute here. Okay. We do not seem to be getting that. Okay. Um, can you can you see me back? Oh, I think I have to stop sharing this and then go to a Word document. I am tangled in why. I, oh, there we go. Okay, great. Let's, I'm going to stop sharing for a second because I think that's what I have to do to get you in, restart sharing again to get you into the Word document that presents the lab. I think that's this one. Okay. Share this thing. There. Do you now see a Word document that's lab exploring the world of spectroscopy? Thumbs up on that one. You do. Okay, very good. All right. So this is what a typical lab looks like. Um, obviously, they were originally written as handouts, which is one way they still look at handouts. One might change them up to be more canvas, uh, to springboard off canvas better. But on the other hand, this is a lab that's going to ask a student to go away from their computer and build and make something. So it might be an advantage for those who could print it out that they could take this away as a handout. A um, little bit of background tells you what supplies you'll need. And in this particular lab, what you need, and I think you can still see my picture here, uh, you need an unused, not an unused, some sort of CVD, DVD, CD, DVD that you have. You make for, and everybody's familiar, I think, with the sort of colored iridescence that you get on one of these things. That doesn't do you spectroscopy unless you make something or it doesn't do you very helpful spectroscopy unless you do a, something that allows you to make a viewer with a little slit in it that then allows you to, and I'm just going to see if I can make this happen. Sometimes I can, oh, you know, that's pretty good. It allows you to control your light path and produce some really lovely line spectra. Admittedly, no calibration on the line spectra, but it's good enough that you can actually go out and do spectroscopy of lights in your house, lights in your neighborhood. I had a wonderful evening after I first made one of my, my first one of these where I went out and discovered that not only do I have, perhaps unsurprisingly, neon, real neon advertising signs in my neighborhood, I found a movie theater that had a mercury advertising, mercury vapor advertising sign, which just thrilled me. Um, students seemed to like this one. I, uh, no, I wasn't said, I didn't, 
I was going to show a little video of a student showing off hers and all the things she'd done, uh, but I didn't, I didn't load that because I figured it would actually take us too much time and I'd get too excited about the video. But that, I would argue that that is real world investigation. It's real things in the real world. It's pretty good spectra, even though they don't have a calibration scale. It is for po fo astronomy folks who've ever done this. It's a better spectrum. You remember those old Project Star blue plastic or gray cardboard spectroscopes that you could order and, as a kit or, or, or ready-made and you had to pay, I don't know, like $20, $30 for each student and you'd have order for a few hundred dollars a class set. The spectra here are better even though the calibration doesn't exist. So if a student could you if you thought using those allowed a student to investigate spectroscopy in your classroom, I think this does a pretty good job of that. You can then ask them to photograph their spectra or sketch their spectra. Most people photograph. And then they can compare their sample spectra with, um, you can send them to, uh, somewhere down here, you can send them to um, libraries of actual spectra and they can diagnose what spectra they're seeing. And if that's not real gen ed spectroscopy, I don't know what is. So I think that's a nice example of an actual face to face, uh, sorry, an actual lab that is as hands-on as a face-to-face -face lab would be, even if it is possibly a little bit awkward and possibly a little bit less information because you don't have the wavelengths, but it captures the essential learning outcome. I have no doubt of that. Hey, Joanne. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asks, is the design available on a website somewhere? And, and the website we saw in the document, is that where it is? Uh, awesome. Yes, exactly. Arvind Gupta Toys. And I actually have been trying to collect designs for paper, cardboard, spectroscopes for a long time. And uh, he has many at this sort of, it used to be called, I think, um, tra Toys from Trash. Uh, this one is so simple that you could actually probably just draw it on a piece of paper yourself, but you absolutely can get instructions at this link. And maybe after this, we'll share enough stuff that people can find their way to these instructions. It okay. is so easy. It and for those, uh, for those younger students who don't have or don't even know what a DVD is or a, a CD, then what is the alternative for them? What is the alternative? The alternative could be several things. One could be to go rustle one up somewhere. Um, that might be more an instructor responsibility. And I don't know that it works in this COVID epidemic, but certainly in more ordinary times, I feared exactly that some of my students wouldn't have one. So I appealed around my college and asked if a few people had some CDs that no longer sparked joy in their home. And about three weeks later, I was the proud owner of somewhere between 500 and 1,000 CDs that various people on campus um, decided they would rather that I owned rather than they owned. So I have so many to give away. So they're out there in the community. Uh, that's the kind of thing that if you were into sending kits, you could just send used. I mean, mine's a used one. It's something my daughter downloaded. Um, you could send those out right now. At worst, you'd say, all right, that lab's not for you. Pick a different lab. That is the reason for variety. That is absolutely the reason for variety. And I don't know how many people don't have that, don't have some old used CD hanging around. I will know that when I've run it a few more times and see, and I, nobody said to me, I can't find that, but of course they may simply have gone on to use a different thing. Got it. All right, we're- you wanna look at another one or do we have more questions? Well, um, I tell you what, we are now at about 2.15, so we've got 15 minutes left. I'd like to uh, uh, allow folks to unmute themselves if they wish to, to ask questions. Let I'm gonna go that. back to face-to-face -to -face and stop sharing things and okay. see you all. Okay. All right, there, I've just allowed you all to unmute yourselves if you'd like to ask a question audibly, and if so, um, you have the ability to raise your hand um, if you uh, click on the participants uh, window, you'll see there's a way to raise your hand and we can 
uh, see that you're interested in speaking. And uh, right now I see Alicia would like to ask a question or make a comment. So yeah, um, I'm, you may have covered this. Uh, my internet kicked out and then I rejoined, so I might have missed this. But um, Clio Labs has some really excellent spectroscopy simulations where you have to open the telescope and do all this stuff. And right now it still works under Windows 10. I'm just wondering, does anybody know, are they planning on updating that at all so it can work under other platforms? I know it's been a very long time since Clea has been out there and doing things. Yeah, I don't know about that. And I like Clea a lot. I will say my students seem to like Clea somewhat less because it doesn't meet their audiovisual expectations. It looks like it was built when it was built, which was, I don't know, when was Clea built? The 80s or the 90s, maybe? 90s. 97. 90s. 90s. And it's got lots of good stuff, but it is pot you need to add stuff to that so it isn't a black box with them saying, I've learned a pattern of what I click my way through, and it produces kind of the answer that I think my teacher's expecting, but I don't know what these numbers are. You need to be sure that your students know what is represented. This is the absolute opposite of Labster, where there is no doubt that it's got a little um, logo of a pendulum swinging back and forth that's realistic enough you know it's a pendulum swinging back. It's line drawings of simulations. So I think the teacher's work is that also the, the write-ups demand some reading and you might need to think about whether that meets your student's reading level, but it would be great if CLIA were updated. I've been using the um, stellar spectroscopy part of it before COVID happened and the students mm -hmm. actually loved it in my class. Oh, oh, they good. loved opening the dome and doing all the crazy stuff and you can actually pick your own stars. So you can make it uh, so that it is not that somebody can do it and then pass the answers on to somebody else. Okay, all right, that's a, a good vote. I'm glad that of that. I mean, Clea is, is great for what it does. I have another, uh, oh, this is a thumbs up. Okay, not a hand. Uh, Jatilla, I see you're unmuted. Did you wanna say something or ask a question? Oh, just hi. Hello, <laughs> Joanne. Hi. I haven't danced with you for a long time. I know, I know. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Here's some hands. Uh, Sina, would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Yeah. Does Clear run on Apple or Chrome? No. Does anybody know? Because you said it runs under Windows 10, but a lot of students have Apple and they have Chrome computers. So whatever we write or whatever we use has to be internet based, it has to be browser based. Right, like um, you know, uh, an applet, basically. Right. I think I can tell you a little bit more about that. Okay. Uh, so there are maybe one or two labs that, if you search the internet very in, in in depth, you will find somebody has converted to be able to run under Apple systems. That's it. Uh, it so this lets us know that it is possible to convert Clio Labs to run under Apple OS's, but almost nobody's done this. Uh, so it's very, very unfortunate. It, it will only run under Windows 10 um, operating systems. And for this reason, uh, last year, I actually got my college to buy 30 uh, Windows laptops so that my students could run CLIA labs, because some of them I just think are fantastic. The spectroscopy ones in particular, I very much like. And mm -hmm. there's one about Hubble redshift that they measure the redshift looking at spectra. It's straightforward, real world kind of stuff, although simplified for them. And I've rewritten the instructions for all the labs so they aren't uh, the ones that come with CLIA, which are like 20 pages long. Mine yeah, like two pages long. <laughs> I think you have to do that. I will say that my um, Moons of Jupiter lab owes, it completely owes its doability to the fact that when I looked at the way CLIA did that, they just used intelligent units that streamline it, um, whereas most of us were not, were instantly asking people to convert from, um, from for instance, solar masses to kilograms and infinitely increasing our students' effort, whereas it's very, so they're very intelligent about what they do. Maybe both re, some rewriting of the instructions and, and up rewriting, transforming the actual labs into a different, a different uh, something more browser-based if possible would be very good. That would yeah. take, I think, time and money. Certainly uh, browser-based applications are 
uh, usually most accessible and easier for students. Um, that doesn't say you can't have a student download an application and install, but um, but not if they're on their phone. And I think that's, on their phone, that's, that's my comment issue, about right. variety is that we do have people struggling to do these things on completely right now struggling to do these things on completely inadequate technology, which is one reason why somebody might make a sundial and somebody else might do spectroscopy. And I think we need to make our peace with the idea that you can legitimately do it either way. I think if you were training pre-nursing students, you couldn't make your peace with anything like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have to know certain things and somebody will die if they don't know the right thing. I don't think that's true of gen ed astronomy classes. And I think we, we, we need to give ourselves permission to embrace that. So do use CLIA for the people who, for whom it works and offer a sundial activity. For, the, for some people, a sundial activity would be dreadful. They don't want it at all. They'd much rather have CLIA. Very good. I think we've handled the questions. So Joanne, we do have some time if you want to get into another lab sheet. Okay. All right. Well then let me, let me go back to share my screen and then I'll click around it. If anybody has a particular lab, they want to type in and Bob could forward it to me and I will, I'll, 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 I'll take that into account as I am working through my screen share here. Actually, Andrew raised his hand. Maybe he could ask a question while you're doing that. Oh, sure. Ask away. Yeah, I saw it come up in the chat and it's the same question I had. I had used the Stellarium before, which is a free, uh, um, free uh, planetarium software. Mm -hmm. Have you used it before in the... Uh, oh, yes. Let me click down here to my Sky Motions lab, which is down here with, uh, I think it's down in the cluster. Motions of the sky. Okay, so a Stellarium is one choice I give students. And once again, it's, it's sort of the same format. Uh, I'll click here for instructions. I actually allow students to use, maybe I shouldn't, maybe that will only slow us up. I think I won't download the instructions. I'll describe a little. I allow students to use Stellarium and you can't, there's a gorgeous big download for Stellarium, but there's a perfectly fine, completely online Stellarium you could use with your browser. But you also are, almost certainly know that there are lots of programs out there like Sky Safari and Sky Map that you use on your phone. And some of these have amazing inertial navigation so that if you're sitting here and you look up at your phone, it shows you what's through in the sky, if you could see the sky, if it were night in that direction, you could see it. You can look down through the earth and see what you'd see on the other side of the earth. Um, the, my Motions of the Sky Lab allows students to choose either one of those they want, because not everybody can, can or wishes to put that on their phone. Um, you can do it with Stellarium, you can do it with Sky Safari, and it coaches them basically to look at motions of the sky. And then it, once they've got a kind of hand, handle on what you can see that way, then it asks them to devise some kind of their own little investigation. Uh, suggested are things like how many hours of daylight do you have at the first of each month going around the year or other things. And uh, the grading standard for that is that they really do write down how they find what the, well, that they really make, they have, have drawn a theory, they make a hypothesis, they tell you how they test the hypothesis and then they tell you if uh, their hypothesis is supported. So it does, it's a little bit of a method activity. It's a little bit of a sky navigation activity. If they do that and then also are doing the moon lab, it does help them find the sun, for instance, during the night. And since I'm asking in my moon lab, mostly that they look at the angle between the sun and the moon and relate that to phases, it gives them a tool that they can also use in another lab. Um, Sky Safari has a whole bunch of other data that it gives you about anything you're looking at, which is sort of cool. And some people just fall in love with the tool, which I think is kind of fun, that they end up discovering that for a very small amount of money, this is a tool they'll have in their pocket that they could do astronomy whenever they want to when they finish the class. I mean, I certainly have had colleagues come breathless to me, one of our mathematicians, when he discovered that his phone could do this, just came to me all, all excitement and roses and said, are you using this? Are you using this? And I thought, why am I not using this? Let's use this. So if it's so appealing 
well, it's pretty appealing. But Sky Stellarium, so this is, this is a very simple set of things that are applicable to several different programs. You could get more complicated, but it does offer, as I keep saying, variety. And I think one thing to understand, of course, in using any of these things is for some people in navigation, it'll be too intuitive and obvious. And for some people, simple is plenty. We get such a variety of levels of technical skill and background information in these classes. So I like what got written into this lab as a simple tool, tool learning activity, a hypothesis activity, and then a sort of do whatever you want piece to it. So yeah. Joanne, yeah, Joanne, you asked me to push this till the end of the show. Um, the question, how do you maintain relationship between lecture and lab, but also have less synchronizing between lecture and lab? And uh, another question related right after that, do you at Chafee require concurrent enrollment in lecture lab? Ah, okay. So not only do we require concurrent at Chafee, not only do we require concurrent enrollment in lecture and lab, um, we have our lab B as a lab come as a lab lecture combination for unit course, and it's only lab is only paired with the planets course. The stars course has no lab. My husband's college Citrus does exactly the reverse. It also has a four unit lecture lab and a just a lecture course, but in their case, they're pairing the lab with stars, galaxies, and cosmology and letting planets have no lab. No right or wrong answer to that, utterly idiosyncratic reasons for that. Um, so not only do when students have, the, have them at the same time, they pretty much must have them with the same instructor and the same, um, the same other students in their section so that it's very easy to talk about one part of the lab, one part of the course in the other part of the course. In fact, there's kind of, doesn't feel like there's any trans, whether you're in the same room or online, it doesn't feel like there's any transition really between lab and lecture. So synchronicity, that was really what the cluster was about. The cluster was about the, cl the, the cluster of seven labs of which you get to choose four in this awkward upload to um, lab upload slots as opposed to having them crafted as assignments. Um, that's what that was about. It was to get them to a point in the course where they were ready to, well, for, I shall say, the first three labs everybody has to do and they have a specific time and they come at the right point in the material. But then when they've got a bit of background, then they can start doing any one of these different things and at that point, yeah, the synchronicity isn't as good as it should be. And I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. I think the answer is probably to have discussion boards for the labs where if you've done a particular lab, you are either asked or required to participate in a discussion of that lab with other students in a discussion board. Uh, that's good enough for what I do. I don't know if it would be good enough for if you were doing, say, anatomy labs, that might okay. not meet what was needed. Uh, we are running out of time. We have some hands raised. Jason Trento, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, one of the things that's been hard about getting labs uh, online, I'm the first to offer astronomy online at Duke College, is convincing uh, uh, the curriculum committee and our uh, VP of instruction the difference between a lab that they do by themselves and homework. And, uh, you know, how does this, how do you differentiate between the two? Because I just see homework, um, not, you know, the interaction with the uh, instructor and the instructor's presence in the lab environment. Thank you. Okay, I think it's somewhat ill-defined. I'll give my answer and then I may ask Bob to weigh in on this one. But my feeling is that within the um, ast astronomy community, the essential nature of labs is that you are not talking about theory, but you are relating theory to a reasonable, some sort of reasonable data set. Uh, that may not meet the actual uh, Carnegie unit description of what a lab is or any other description for what a lab is, but it's a very um, science-based description. A lab is when you are, um, doing some part of measuring the way the theory plays out in the real world, whether you're actually testing a hypothesis or in some cases in gen ed, where you're just giving students an actual experience of a part of the real world. 
that they haven't experienced otherwise. I'll point to my infrared lab where they're not really taking data, they're just looking at pictures. However, many of them have not looked at pictures in the infrared or not looked carefully or thought, I mean, they've all seen that the alien in alien movies always sees in the infrared, that's the filmmaker's trick. But they haven't stopped and been asked to talk about that in terms of transmission, emission, um, absorption, a reflection. And, and so just making them talk about a picture with appropriate vocabulary forces an interaction with real world stuff that goes way beyond, um, goes beyond the lecture treatment. Okay, that's my point, but maybe Bob yeah. has some points of view that are, well, are, are addition to that. Because we've run out of time, I would say uh, this is up to your curriculum committee and I would go to your curriculum committee co-chairs and this is a faculty body and, and they know what a lab is by all definitions and they, the curriculum committee has the authority in that area. Um, now, let me give you a little advice. If you liked all you saw in the chat, you can save that on your own computer by opening up the participant window. Lower left right corner, lower right corner, you'll see three horizontal dots. Click on that and you should see a way to um, save chat. Did I say participants? I meant the chat window. If you click on the chat, it'll open up the window. Click on the three dots. You'll see save chat as one of your options and you can save uh, the uh, resources that were shared. I'll also save it as well, so, so we all have it. Thank you, Joanne, for a fantastic presentation. Yes, we are going to share this recording with anyone who registered and, and beyond. We have some more uh, science lab webinars coming up in biology and chemistry. Let me share in chat the, um, the link to our events page, CDC OEI events page, you'll see those events uh, posted there. And we uh, are at one team also manages a YouTube channel. I'm going to save that as well, uh, share that in chat as well. Mm. Uh, for any of our recorded webinars, that is another place to get them. But I, since you registered, I have your email address and I'll send you the, the link. You to know, it recording. occurs to me, I never really got to my final point, which I will make the one sentence plea for. Mm -hmm. I would really like to get a group of us working together, possibly with resources that CVC OEI could provide to really develop a good stable of labs, a good library of labs that we think do the variety of things labs need to do and make that available. So I think we could probably communicate more after and later, but I think that would be a, I said work in progress. We need to make progress on this work folks and you would be a great group of people. I would love to work with you more on that. So I just wanted to get that little word in there. Very good. Yeah, let me follow this up with an email to all of you with some options for where we might collaborate and share. Um, and uh, we can, move that offline, but then reconnect in that way. We don't want it to end here. No. Thank you, Joanne, again. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you all. And we will see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you.